Hi everyone, this is Dr. Stefan. Welcome to Interstitial Lung Disease Info. In this episode, I'd like to talk to you about interstitial lung abnormalities. And this may be a vague term, but it actually means a specific thing. So interstitial lung abnormalities, or ILAs, so that's the acronym that is commonly used in our field, just uh, defines the presence of these changes that we find on, the, on a lung uh, scan. So on a chest CT scan, we find some abnormalities in the lungs. In people we where we don't expect that they would have interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. So maybe someone has a CT scan for another reason. Maybe they are going for a lung cancer screening program. They have a scan for their abdomen then that picks up some changes in the lungs. When we find um, these abnormalities that affect more than 5% of any lung zone, this is what the definition um, currently holds, that we, we find these in people where we don't expect that they would have an interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. And these changes affect more than 5% of any lung zone, and they're not explained by fluid overload or some other change that uh, that is in that that person's uh, um, you know uh, disease process we don't we don't expect that we would find anything on the lungs basically but we find these abnormalities in any lung zones for example in the upper parts of the lung middle parts of the lung bottom parts of the lung more than five percent then we would call that interstitial lung abnormalities now these are fairly common so this is the problem where, that we have because actually in uh, they're very commonly found like i said in lung cancer screening programs so when people have smoke quite a lot they may be offered to have a lung uh, scan to determine whether they may have lung cancer. In many situations, there is no cancer found, great news, but other things may be picked up because a lung CT is quite quite a detailed examination. So it may pick up a lot of small changes. So it's it's been found, and I'll leave a reference to an article that summarizes this really, really well, that four to 9% of cigarette smokers may have these interstitial lung abnormalities. And even people who did not smoke, two to seven percent may also find have these changes. So when we do a CT scan in a general population, especially maybe after a certain age, we might find that quite a lot of people, just under ten percent, may have these changes. So if you're thinking about maybe one in twenty people having these abnormalities, it's quite a lot of people. So what do we do with this? Because this can cause an avalanche of uh, opinions being sought from respiratory clinics, from interstitial lung disease specialists, because we don't know what these abnormalities mean. Do they represent an early interstitial lung disease, early pulmonary fibrosis? Will it get worse? Will it impact the, the, the treatment for potentially lung cancer or other things? So actually, this this has been looked at, and it's it's actually a big, big problem that's emerging, and we need to find a way to deal with it. So a lot of research is needed in this field. But what type of abnormalities can be found, and how can they be classified? Let's delve a little bit deeper. So th there are a lot of radiological terms that I will mention now, because these you may, you may find on a radiological report, if these are found um, in your case or in someone you know. So things like ground glass or reticular abnormalities, <laughs> architectural distortion of the lung parenchyma, traction bronchiectasis or bronchioloectasis, honeycombing, non-emphysematous cysts. So these are just descriptors. I won't describe each and every one of them, but they're basically just little abnormalities that the radiologist may describe on a scan consisting of interstitial lung abnormalities. Now, where can these be found in the lungs? We can classify these interstitial lung abnormalities depending on where they are in the lungs. And some areas may suggest that there's a higher risk for developing an interstitial lung disease than others. So the main thing would be if these changes are subpleural fibrotic. I'll explain what this means. So subpleural fibrotic means that basically the changes are just under the outside of the lung uh, surface. So the outside of the lung surface is covered by a thin membrane called the pleura. Anything that's found just under that membrane is called subpleural. That's the area of the lung. And then fibrotic just means scarring, scarred. So fibrosis is scarring. It's the same word. It's just a medical term for that. So if we have changes that suggest lung scarring, so for example, this could be reticulation, traction, bronchi bronchiectasis, things like that, that can be found just under the outside of the lungs, the outside of the, the, the pleura, that would be subpleural fibrotic, and that would be a situation in which there's a higher risk of progression to a full-blown interstitial lung disease. So these may actually represent early interstitial lung disease, so they may require more monitoring. Now, some of the changes may be found within the lung, so that would be non-subpleural. Or maybe they will, be, they will have, uh, people may have changes that are subpleural, 
and non-fibrotic. So we would have maybe abnormalities that we don't consider. They are scarred. There's, they don't consist of scar tissues. For example, we might have little ground glass changes, which may be found also subpleurally, so on the outside of the lungs. But maybe we don't feel that those are more in keeping with pulmonary fibrosis. So depending on how we classify these, the risk may be different for that particular person to develop a full bone ILD, a progressive form of pulmonary fibrosis. So this is quite important. Now, there's another important topic to mention here. What's the connection with respiratory symptoms? So if someone is found to have interstitial lung abnormalities, it does not imply that everything was found incidentally, that person was absolutely fine. It could be that someone still has respiratory symptoms. They may be breathless, they may be coughing. They may have uh, impaired lung function testing results, so maybe their breathing tests were a bit low. It is possible that we find uh, the interstitial lung abnormalities in this context. So it's always a question of trying to figure out, is that change on the lung enough to explain those symptoms? Are there other things that may be going on? So for, for example, someone who has severe heart failure, severe heart disease, they're probably going to be breathless because of that rather than these small changes that affect maybe five to ten percent of the lung so it, we need to kind of play um we need to interpret everything in context so that's that's really important but when someone has both respiratory symptoms and these interstitial lung abnormalities we need to think about whether this actually represents an early form of interstitial lung disease that may require monitoring over time. So it's really important to try and get the opinion right, to try to classify what's going on and what's the risk for that particular individual. Now, there's also another situation that's really important. If we find these interstitial lung abnormalities when we're actively looking for them, that's more likely to be an interstitial lung disease. So we sometimes do screening for interstitial lung disease in people who are at high risk. So this would include people who have family history, strong family history, so maybe brothers, parents who had pulmonary fibrosis, and we want to see whether, you know, a person who's maybe not having a lot of respiratory symptoms may also have interstitial lung disease. So if they have strong family history, or also if they have a condition that may predispose them to getting interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, that's when we would actively screen, we would actively do a scan to try to figure out whether that person might be actually having an interstitial lung disease. So this another so some examples would include, like I said, family history, when you know you've got two, two, three brothers with pulmonary fibrosis. You know, it might be worth considering testing with a chest CT scan once just to make sure that there isn't um, you know, interstitial lung disease in your case. Or if someone is suffering from, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, it's quite significant, the rheumatologist may recommend doing a chest CT scan to try to see whether there's lung involvement from the rheumatoid arthritis, because that's a fairly common occurrence. So that's something where uh, we would, in that context, maybe think that those interstitial lung abnormalities are more an interstitial lung disease than just an incidental random finding. So what, what does this mean? It means that when we find these interstitial lung abnormalities, we need to always consider the risk that they may actually progress to a full-blown interstitial lung disease, and they may actually represent early pulmonary fibrosis. That's, that's something that we need to consider. Also, if we find these, for example, in the context of lung cancer screening, it's important to note that sometimes people who have these interstitial lung abnormalities may also have a higher risk of complications when we are treating them for cancer of the lung. So maybe reacting badly to certain treatments. So it's important to keep in mind these associations. It's something that's not ideal when we find it, but we need to kind of always try to work between clinicians who are handling different uh, aspects of that person's care to try to make sure that they have optimal treatments. Now, what are the risk factors for finding these interstitial lung abnormalities? Who might actually develop these? Where do we find them more commonly? Generally, the, the, there's a higher risk for the presence of these ILAs or interstitial lung abnormalities in people who have an older age, um, who have smoked for a long time, who have had other exposures from the environment, other inhalational exposures, breathing in certain things like vapor, uh, fumes, dust, air pollution, things like that, and those who have a genetic predisposition. So strong family history of interstitial lung disease. And I think any clinician who's, uh, who's uh, reviewing patients for potential interstitial lung disease should think specifically about whether that person has a connective tissue disease, 
if they have things like rheumatoid arthritis, systemic sclerosis, higher risk of finding these interstitial lung abnormalities. People who have strong family history, so familial interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, and specific exposures such as being exposed to asbestos, silica dust, and significant smoking. So I think these are important things to look out for. And then uh, I, I want to add another word on lung function testing because that's really important. Because these abnormalities can be quite limited in, in volume uh, affected in the lungs. So like I said, the definition re refers to something that affects maybe just above 5% of any lung zone. So that's not really the full lung effect being affected. So the initial lung capacities that we mention, measure on a spirometry may not be affected at the in the first instance. It may be that the second part of the breathing test, which is usually done, which is called the gas transfer test or the DLCO or TLCO measure, may be a little bit more reduced, a bit more than the lung capacity. So that could be an indication, but in some cases, the lung function may be normal initially. This is why it's important to, to try and have both spirometry and gas transfer measurement in people who have interstitial lung abnormalities and to follow the trend long-term to see what's going on with the lung function over time. Also, we may want to think about other lung function testing. So sometimes lung function testing may involve standardized walk tests. So we see, we try to quantify how far that person is able to walk, how quickly, and what happens to their oxygen levels. That's also a form of lung function testing. And there are some standardized tests such as the six minute walk test or the shuttle walk test. So these can be done in lung function departments. And if we do them over time, we can have an idea of whether that person's actually getting worse. Of course, we always need to rule out other causes for breathlessness or other causes for impaired lung function testing values. So that's always important. But the main thing I wanted to try and uh, get at with this video is that there is no consensus for long-term monitoring. So this is a big problem because we need a lot more research into what happens over time with people who have these things detected on their chest CT scans. Probably the reasonable thing to do would be to try to reduce risk factors for developing interstitial lung disease. And that's generally trying to avoid smoking, environmental, uh, exposures. So if you're breathing in asbestos, if you're breathing in lots of dust and construction, you're breathing in silica dust, um, be careful if you're a stonemason, if you're working with artificial stone, engineered stone that contains high amounts of silica, try to avoid that. Use protection, use masks to try and protect your breathing, um, your airways, because, you know, these things do offer you a higher risk for developing a full-blown interstitial lung disease. So if we have these found on your chest CT scan, it's probably wise to try to reduce your environmental exposures as much as possible. Also, what we might want to do, again, there's no consensus, but we might want to have a regular checkup over time. So maybe a clinical visit, so with your doctor, a review with your doctor who may ask you about your symptoms, quantify your exercise tolerance, how much you're able to do, and kind of record this data in consultations over time, maybe at least yearly to have this done, and to have a lung function test. So a breathing test may be done at least once a year, maybe a bit more often, but not you don't have to obsess about it, but it, it is wise to kind of monitor the trend over time and just record the values, what's happening over time. If a lung function decline is noted, so if your breathing tests are starting to go down, probably it's wise doing a repeat chest CT scan to see whether the images on the lungs have progressed, have gone worse, because that would strongly suggest that there's an interstitial lung disease actually there and not just some random incidental findings. Some people may choose to repeat the CT scan Anyway, so, you know, your doctor may recommend doing another repeat CT scan at 12 months, 24 months, five years, depending on your age, depending on your context, there may be a recommendation to repeat this chest CT scan anyway, just because sometimes the lung function may not pick up the initial decline because the volume of the lung affected may be very small. So even a small progression in, the, in, in those abnormalities may not change the capacity of the lung initially. So that's why there's no consensus yet whether there's a room for more genetic testing to be done, things like that to try to help, whether we need to do autoimmune screening in, in patients who have these abnormalities, what we normally need to do in terms of uh, workup for these situations. There's no consensus, but I think it's important to try and get as much as possible a specific opinion from a specialist in interstitial lung diseases if these things are found.
or at least to have some routine monitoring. And I know this may be difficult in some parts of the world, but you know, trying to get the, the optimum care may be difficult in this field. But I think with this video, I just tried to outline that this is a problem that's emerging. We're finding more and more of these interstitial lung abnormalities the more we scan people's chests. And it's something that we need to try and figure out how to monitor going forward. Hopefully this was helpful. If you have further questions, leave them in the comment section below. I'll also leave a link to this article that summarizes things quite well. It's scientific, but it should be an interesting read for those of you who are interested in, in uh, having more information about interstitial lung abnormalities. Thank you very much for watching. All the best. Good health.